Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our session um, this afternoon called uh, The Value of Student Research, American Public University Initiatives in Support of Online Education. And what we have for you uh, this afternoon is a panel discussion with uh, about a half dozen uh, APUS faculty members who are going to talk about um, the involvement of students in various research pro projects. And the purpose of our workshop is to highlight uh, the function and development of a fully online student research uh, groups at the American Public University system. Let me introduce myself. Um, what, what we'll do, uh, the plan for today is um, to, uh, my, my name is Ed Albin, and I am the department chair for the Department of Space Studies at American Public University System. And the agenda today is to overview, very quickly overview our program and to introduce our faculty, then we'll open up uh, for panel discussion questions. So let, let me say a few things about uh, the department, which was founded in 2007. It's a fully online uh, program in space studies, and we have three degree levels that are stackable, uh, the associate's degree, bachelor's of science, and a master's in science uh, that build on each other in um, space studies. We have five associated concentrations, astronomy, aerospace sciences, which will soon be transitioning. That particular con uh, concentration will be transitioning over to um, space engineering. Uh, we have a relatively new concentration called Earth and Planetary Sciences, another uh, space policy, and another concentration in space entrepreneurship. And we're currently working on two new concentrations, one uh, dealing with drones, and this would be at the undergraduate level, uh, UAS, Unmanned Aerial Systems, and also another concentration that's under development at the graduate level called Human Factors in Space. So, with our theme this year for our CESA conference being preparing for the cosmos and readying the next generation of space explorers, uh, what we'd like to do again is to highlight um, uh, various research projects that are happening at the university uh, under the guidance of our faculty. And these are student based uh, projects. And we, we have a very large student population, roughly 900 undergraduate students in space studies with uh, 350 um, graduate students. So 900 undergrads and 350 graduate students who are pursuing uh, degrees uh, at one level or another um, in our space studies program. So our department has two uh, premier student research groups. Uh, the first one is our Supernova Research Group. And the other group is the Exoplanet Research Group. And both of these groups that our faculty are gonna be talking about today uh, utilize the American Public University Systems uh, Wallace E. Boston Observatory, which houses a fully online um, research grade 24 inch CDK plane wave telescope. And it's designed to perform astronomical research. And I want to put a plug in tonight. Uh, the weather looks clear where the telescope is housed in Charlestown, West Virginia. And we will be doing a 
online star party beginning at 9 p.m. And you can find that in the uh, program schedule. So if you're available tonight looking for something to do and the weather is clear, um, please do join us uh, tonight online where you can see the telescope in action and actually learn about some of the research projects from our students who will be there assisting with um, that presentation tonight. So uh, finally, our, our supernova search group is a large organization of students, and this gives them the opportunity to work with a telescope to detect primarily transient objects over a large portion of the sky, examining galaxies on clear nights. And our exoplanet research group is another group uh, hosted by our faculty that involves uh, student team members that analyze exoplanet transit obser observations. So what I'd like to do now is um, introduce our faculty and then give them a chance to say a little bit about themselves and uh, the research projects that they have ongoing with our students. And we'll begin with Dr. Kristen Miller, who is a professor, full-time professor in the Department of Space Studies at the university. So we'll hand it off to you, Kristen. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Um, yeah, so like I said, I'm a um, professor of space studies here at APUS. I've been with APUS about um, a little over six years now, I think. And uh, I'm involved with some of the research groups here at, in the space studies department. Um, we, I'm one of the faculty advisors for the um, supernova search group, uh, which is one of the original and oldest, longest standing, I guess, um, research organizations here at APUS. And I'm also one of the co-advisors for the Exoplanet Research Group. And, and just to put a plug in there, I'm also um, a faculty advisor for the APUS Analog Research Group, which won't be part of this panel, but um, we encourage you to, um, to check out if you aren't familiar with it. All I'm right. very thanks. excited and honored to be part of the panel. So thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Chris. Kristen, and then we're going to hand it off to Caitlin Milliman, who is also a full-time faculty member in the department and an assistant professor of space studies. Hi, uh, I, as Dr. Albin said, I'm a full-time faculty here. Uh, I also am the co-faculty advisor for the students for the exploration and development of space. Um, so mainly with the research opportunities, there's some informal projects that we've done through SEDS. Um, the, uh, for example, the Radio Jove project where students can construct their own dipole telescopes in their backyards and try to pick up radio storms from Jupiter, which has been really fun. Um, and then more formalized, I am advisor or co-advisor to the Exoplanet Research Group. All right. Thank you so much, Caitlin. And I'll hand it over to Michael Zillenhofer, who will tell us a little bit about himself and his research. Uh, he is a part-time faculty member with the Department of Space Studies. Thanks, uh, Dr. Alvin. So uh, I, I'm, uh, like you had just said, uh, I'm Michael Zallenhofer, and I am uh, one of the part-time faculty members uh, in the department. And uh, I am also a, a co-advisor for the uh, Student Exploration Development for Space, uh, who have done a number of projects uh, and it's pretty amazing to be a part of such a collaborative group and I'm also one of the co-advisors for the Exoplanet Research Group um, which is coming along quite nicely. All right thanks Michael and now um, we'll have Terry Trevino introduce himself. Terry is a um, part-time faculty member and also our lead Observatory assistant uh, yeah, and advisor you. at the thank you, Dr. university. Yeah. And thank you very much. I, I, it's uh, an honor for me to have graduated from AMU APUS and now having this opportunity to to teach um, part time adjunct, uh, which I absolutely love and enjoy. And then, of course, I manage um, 
underneath Dr. Mellor, I manage the observatory and, uh, and yeah, honor to sit with my favorite people. So great to be here. Very good. Thanks, Terry. Yep. And Jeremy, la last but not least, uh, Jeremy Wood, who's also a part-time faculty member who has um, been involved with our students and is doing some pretty cool research. If you want to say a little bit about yourself and your research, Jeremy, that, that would be great. Thanks, Ed. I'm Dr. Jeremy Wood. I'm in the Space Studies program here uh, at the university. And I'm a theoretical astrophysicist, and I work in the area of dynamics of small solar system bodies. Basically, I study how the orbits of comets, asteroids, and other small bodies evolve over time. I brought a PowerPoint with me in case anybody needs me to go into more detail. Totally awesome. Thanks, Jeremy. And, and let me just say a little bit about my research. My background is in planetary sciences. Uh, specifically planetary geology, and I do photogeologic mapping of the moon, Mars, asteroids, and also uh, field research on terrestrial impact craters with one pro uh, project uh, that I've been working on with another faculty member who's not with us here, um, Stephen Jarrett. Uh, we are working on um, impact material associated with the Chesapeake Bay crater, a crater that's 35 million years old, located in southeastern Virginia. And some of the deposits are found in east central Georgia, Georgia tektites, and also in central, south central Texas, uh, just north of Houston, the Badia sites, which are tektites there. So we've been working with these. And we currently have a, a, a project underway to analyze the geochemistry and density of, of the Georgiaites or tektites in Georgia in East Central Georgia. So we'll be involving several of our uh, American Public University students in that project. Okay, so let's go ahead and open up to uh, some discussion questions and I will monitor the chat for questions from our audience. And I will kick it off by um, asking what are some of the best practices you've learned from working with student uh, research projects, face-to-face -face or online? So feel free to anyone jump in. I'll jump in. <laughs> um, so this is something that we we think about best practices. We think about a lot with the Supernova Group. The Supernova Group was designed to be a project that all students would be able to participate in. There are no um, requirements for entry. Um, it's open to both undergraduate and graduate students. So we pull from a really wide and diverse um, student population and and students with a um, who come in with with varying degrees of familiarity with astronomical with research in general and with you know re astronomical research with telescope images so um, one of our one of our best um, practices has been to um, be really thoughtful and um, deliberate in the way that we do the training. Um, we want to provide each student with a way to participate and make a valuable contribution um, and kind of meet them where they are and then and move forward. And um, we've developed some training materials to do this, but we've also um, really prioritized student leadership in the group. So our training coordinator is a student who has been through the program, has um, you know, months of experience, they become an expert in the processes, and then they can, um, you know, mentor downward and and help those who come into the program to um, become acclimated and to reach that um, that same level of expertise with the program. So a lot of peer mentorship, a lot of student leadership, um, and and making sure that we are 
you know, while we're a large group that we're really focusing on each student as they come in and, and placing each student on a team so that they're well um, situated to have a successful experience in the group. Very good. Very good. And Terry, do, do you want to say a few words about your I, Yeah, experiences? chime in. Absolutely. As a student, um, yeah. Also student working with first, us. Student faculty. first. And, and I'm not right. here without you and Dr. Miller. And, and, and kudos to Dr. Melliman as well, because I, I wouldn't be here uh, today without uh, your leadership, um, the three of you. Um, so thank you um, immensely. Uh, it's And you were mentioning something about the Chesapeake Crater. So I've uh, recently taken over and managed, started to manage an Arctic research station, but it's right on the edge of the Houghton Crater complex. Mm -hmm. I was just chatting about that with Keston, who's in here now, and some other students. And you, you turn over one of those stones and you actually feel guilty turning over a stone that's you know <laughs> been sitting in place for 30 million years. It's the Arctic desert, the high desert. And so there's very little uh, weathering or, you know, water decay or um, water weathering. So it's, it's amazing when you're there, but uh, back to uh, the supernova research group. So I came in quite early in, in its development phase. And I think Dr. Miller had it up and running for a couple of years. And, uh, and as it worked out perfectly for me, um, timing wise, I, I ended up, you know, having the opportunity to manage the telescope and then run, you know, do the runs every night or when weather is perfect or even not perfect. And um, so I've, I've been very fortunate to to be a, a part of this team. And and I thought the big mess when I first started at the university was there was no, you know, online participation in, in, in these extracurriculars. Um, there's no benefit to it other than the experience, clearly. But, you know, there's no uh, there's no hours. You don't, you know, it doesn't cost you anything to join. But uh, I'm, I'm fascinated with how it worked out. And uh, to this day, uh, you know, being in the Supernova Research Group as a team lead now for the past few years, I'm, I'm loving every minute of it. And uh, shout out to um, Dr. Miller for, you know, letting me, you know, help her through that endeavor. So, yeah, the, the, the research, student research has been phenomenal off the charts. I, I, every year, there's always some student that comes up with something fantastic, uh, interesting, you know, to the end, you're like, oh my God, I've got to figure this stuff out. So, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's amazing. Dr. Mellerman, you know, you've said, you know, I've, I've always been, I wish I could make more SEDS meeting. I apologize for that now, but anyway. Uh, yeah, I and Dr. Wood, you, that, that, uh, that Terry, you came in at a really interesting time in the supernova group because we were we were still developing at that point, and at that point it was mostly it was very small. There were just a few students in it, and um, and Terry was one of the students who who piloted um, transitioning it to a team based format, and I think that team based format has been just the key to. Um, you know, to the growth that we've been able to sustain and to, um, you know, just the way that it's worked. And, um, you know, so Definitely. Terry gets a big, big <laughs> shout out for that because, uh, you know, he and another student came to me and said, hey, I, I think we should do this as teams. And I think we should have team yeah. leads. And I think we need a small group experience within the larger organization. Yeah. And, and, and the beginning of the well. exoplanet group. So the exoplanet group was, you know, we were a seedling of that. And then now that's evolved into this really fantastic group. And I was going to shout out to Dr. Wood, but by, by the way, you're Jeremy, Jeremy, you don't say much about it, but you've got like 10 degrees and, you know, you're, um, you know, <laughs> so astrophysicist, I, you know, good to see you. Jer Jeremy, do you want to say a few things about your, um, your new, or ongoing research project using Access, which is a super computing service uh, to study white dwarf uh, contamination, which sounds really cool. Uh, certainly, yeah. Uh, I'm actually not using Access on that project. It was the one before that, okay. that where I got the Access. But uh, let me go ahead and share my screen then, since you asked. Sure. And uh, I'll discuss a little bit more about what I'm doing right now. But I am working on the White Dwarf Contamination Project, and we got two students that I'm very happy to have that are working with me on that project. What we're doing there is we're looking at 
asteroids that get too close to a white dwarf star. And when they do, tidal forces can rip apart the asteroid. It can, it can either accrete onto the star or the asteroid can get ripped apart into a debris disk that goes in orbit about the white dwarf star. But either way, it contaminates it. But the one that I use the access for, access in case you don't know, is supercomputing. It's an organization that allows you to use other university supercomputers if you don't have one, which I don't. Uh, so I was able to get hooked up with the University of Kentucky and they allowed me to use their supercomputer to do this research. And uh, here it is, this is what came out of it. And I'll be presenting at a conference on this topic in October. Well, let me see if I can bring it up. Here we go. Yes, there we go. Can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm investigating the capture of what we call Trojan asteroids. So let me discuss a little bit about what those are. If you look at the red dot here, if you place it in a circular orbit about a star, there are particular points in and around the orbit that in physics we call equilibrium points. And the two of these are called L4 and L5. Together, they're called the Grange points. These are two of them, L4 and L5. And what can happen is an asteroid can be in or near the same orbit as the planet, and it can kind of librate around the Lagrange point while still being in orbit about the sun. Those are called Trojan asteroids. And here is what the research project is. I have a disk, as you see in black here, and also a little bit in the blue, there's a disk of asteroids. The planet in red is going to migrate inward towards the star. And when it does, it's going to plow in to this disk of asteroids. My project is how many asteroids can we capture as Trojans? Usually you can't capture any, but if you cross something called a mean motion resonance, it introduces chaos in the, at the Lagrange points and new asteroids can come in and get captured. Think of the Lagrange points as like glue traps or fly paper. As the planet moves inward, you can catch these asteroids and then they go into orbit about the Lagrange points. So I wanted to know how many could I capture if the planet migrated inward to the midpoint of the habitable zone? Because if your asteroid is large enough, it actually qualifies as a planet. You can have a planet-sized object there. And it, so it could be habitable if you captured it and moved to the habitable zone. So I wanted to know how many I could capture. So I populated this region with 15,000 asteroids. I used software to simulate the planet migrating inward. And I counted how many I captured. All right, so big reveal. How many did I capture? One out of 15,000. So it, it was kind of a lackluster result. But then I found out that something more exciting happened called shepherding, and that is other asteroids, though they didn't become Trojan asteroids, they did get captured in other mean motion resonances, and they got shepherded it in all the way to the habitable zone. And so that turned out to be a major point of the paper that I wasn't even trying to do. It, it was just like serendipity that this happened and, and saved the work. I suppose one out of 15,000 is a result, but it's kind of a weak result, uh, but the shepherding was very strong. Uh, so it's basically the project that I'm currently working on. And I've, I've also started the White Dwarf project as well. Thank you. Oh, very cool. Very cool. And uh, the, there is a, a question in the chat about how our research projects funded. And I'd, I'd like to mention that we do have American Public University faculty uh, grants where faculty um, can acquire uh, up to 20K to work on a project that involves students. So this would fund both the student and the faculty member for any uh, laboratory tests that need to be made or field work. Uh, that's happening. And um, I wanted to, uh, we, we have a couple of recent grants. Um, 
In, in fact, Michael, if you wanted to say something about your uh, research project related to Vesta, uh, you were looking at polygonal patterns on the surface of the asteroid Vesta. If you sure. if you wanted to share uh, some ideas and work that you've done on that minor planet with students. Absolutely. Um, so I've worked on a number of planetary bodies uh, from like Mercury and Mars to the moon and Vesta and Ceres. And I've done a lot of work with impact craters and looking at the structures, uh, both the morphometric, uh, so the shapes of the craters and the morphological patterns. Um, so the interiors of these craters to really help identify the the really the surface geology and understand the formation and evolution of the bodies. So um, more particularly, Ceres is a really interesting body in, in and of itself, um, having this mixed composition. And since the Dawn spacecraft went to both Vesta and Ceres, it was uh, a new mission of mine to then shift my focus from a Ceres crater database and looking at its morphometric and morphological characteristics of their impact craters and start looking at Vesta. Uh, known to be more of a drier body, yet having some characteristics similar to what we had seen on Ceres. So um, now that I'm looking at Vesta, I'm starting to notice that there are uh, polygonal impact craters as well on Vesta, and it's showing uh, similar signs that we see with Ceres. Um, it's a preliminary investigation right now as um, the database is still being, you know, worked on. Uh, it takes some time to count the craters and you know, look at all the different features. But from this standpoint right now, Vesta is looking to be an interesting body in and of itself as well. Um, Ceres kind of fell in a weird range and Vesta is now falling into an even odder range than what you'd expect for a dry, rocky body. Um, so it could be that it's more porous or there's um, other types of features that uh, are yet to really fully be explored. And the polygonal craters are a huge aspect of that, uh, looking at their shape and understanding how these craters uh, are influenced by either porous features, uh, fractures or structures that are found within the subsurface. Uh, if there's any polar wandering, like we have seen possibly with Ceres, uh, that's highly debatable, but the polygonal craters do indicate that there is some sort of polar wander um, supported by some modeling that's been done. So. Uh, it's really interesting to kind of see that and then start to take that comparison to the other bodies across the solar system, uh, like Mercury or Mars and the moon, even Earth, uh, with meteor crater being a nice square feature. And that is fascinating. And Vesta Vesta is, is an interesting asteroid in that we believe we have uh, samples of Vesta that have fallen to the Earth as meteorites, uh, a type of meteorite, um, a chondrite, eucrite. And years ago, I actually had a, an opportunity to hold a eucrite in my hand, which I believe is uh, from a basaltic lava flow um, on the asteroid Vesta, which is, is so cool. <laughs> um, Caitlin, uh, if you want to if you could maybe talk a little bit about your efforts with this new um, exoplanet research group, you're leading the way with that, which is really exciting. Uh, I can remember way back when the crust was cooling on the, our planet, when I was in grad school, how we were not even sure if there were planets, we thought there were, but we had no evidence of planets around other stars. And now it, it's just amazing that our students are able to use our our 24 inch robotic telescope to uh, study exoplanet light curves. Yeah, it's been really nice. Um, uh, Dr. Miller and Dr. Z are also very active in this, as well as Terry, <clears throat> helping us with telescope access and getting access um, to even other services. But I thought it was a great combination of the uh, access we have with our telescope, the technology that we have through APUS, and also interest from our students. It's a very popular topic. Students see these headlines, they want to get involved, and it's a... Um, I think a very active field and I'm excited to 
see where it goes. We had our initial team has been working on this for about nine months, and we just brought on team two to um, continue the project. And I think building on the, the earlier question about best practices, I think it's it's a really hard but very needed balance to kind of, for these student-led projects of kind of um, the control that you want to have. And like, this is the step, this is the next step, this is the next step, and then the chaos. Because we're kind of taking these students out of a very common practice of a, a classes where you'd have week one, you have week two, everything's laid out, the assignments are given to you, you have due dates, you have rubrics, all of that, and then bringing them into a, in a, to a situation where you don't have that established. And so if it's just a free for all, the students get lost. And if it's too controlling, then the students don't actually get the full research experience and then let their creativity and let their leadership really shine through in the project. So as faculty advisors, we really do try to set up this balance between those two extremes. And so making sure that the students get a true research experience and that they can let their interests really guide them while also putting some guide rails on the situation. Um, and so I think that having a really clear goals that we discuss with the students, constructing this kind of teamwork, um, student-led teams has been really helpful um, to really have a good structure that we can bring in the student creativity and beating goals and have those both coalesce. I think the team-based structure has really helped with that. And then also establishing a code of conduct and making sure that the our expectations for the students are clearly specified. Um, as Dr. Miller mentioned, students come in with a whole range of backgrounds um, and expectations and really making sure that we communicate how they, you know, when they should approach us with questions, what they should be doing, how to do it, how to work in the teams, really just making sure that you have that baseline established and not take it for granted has really been a best practice for having these successful student research groups. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, team's approach has been an excellent way to do this where students can collaborate on uh, observations and utilizing uh, the data. And speaking of the collaboration of students and, and faculty, um, I wanted to circle back to the question in the chat that was uh, put forth about how are student-based research projects at APUS funded and Kristen, can you can you talk a, a little bit about the external NASA grant that you recently received for analog um, astronaut research group? Yeah, of course, happy to. Um, yeah, this was a this was a big deal for us. This was our first, um, my first NASA grant, our group's first NASA grant. So we're pretty excited about it. Um, and uh, and interestingly, um, like like Terry said, this project idea was a spinoff from the Supernova Search Group. So, um, you know, the thing that I love about that is that it's not only been a great project that has involved a wide range of students, but then we've, you know, from that, we've been able to develop the Exoplanet Research Group and we've been able to develop um, these algae studies, which are what we got the grant with. And um, basically what... Um, what the grant is for is to, uh, we, we had this idea, some of us in the Supernova group, Terry was one of them and um, one of our stars in that. And uh, we looked at, you know, what, as we, as we look at space, you know, what, what do we need to be able to go to space? And, and many of you, I hope all of you were at um, Dr. Proctor's talk this morning, which was amazing on um, on space exploration and how we can go to space, um, so inspiring. But um, you know, as we as we kind of contemplated that and looked at student interest and what they were um, what they were interested in and what they wanted to study, one of the things that came up was the use of algae in space. And algae are a natural for space; um, they can grow in a wide range of conditions, many of them extreme. Um, and they also can, uh, you know, they benefit here on earth, they benefit life in many, many different ways. They can fertilize crops, they can treat wastewater, they can, we take them as supplements, you know, there's just so many applications for them on earth. And so we thought about, well, how could we, how could we use them in space? And there's a lot of groups looking at how you can use algae in space. NASA is looking at this and many research groups. And, and we, um, we kind of focused in on 
um, the use of a particular algae as a fertilizer for um, plants grown in um, resources that you might find off world like um, lunar and Martian regolith. So we're using, of course, simulated lunar and Martian regolith. But, um, you know, from this project, we it was an interesting development. I'll let Terry can chime in at any time, but um, it was an interesting development because we, uh, you know, we had been talking about this in the group for a long time and kind of uh, we brought in some um, outside consultants who became part of the group and and helped guide us um, in, in their expertise. So it was a, a multifaceted group um, with a lot of different specialties, uh, which I think strengthened the research idea and helped us to be able to kind of focus in on what we wanted to do and win this grant um, came up, it was through the West Virginia Space Grant Consortium and NASA's space grant consortiums are amazing. They are available in every state in the United States and they are their specific purpose is to fund, um, you know, small scale and fast return research projects like this and to also um, specifically support research in institutions that are developing their research programs and maybe don't, you know, they're, we're not you know, R1 research, and we don't have these established enormous grants that come in all of the time, but we're, we're getting into it and we're, um, you know, involving students in it and we're providing these opportunities. And so that was a kind of a perfect fit. And, um, you know, the West Virginia Space Grant Consortium um, provided the support that we needed and we were able to apply for this grant. It's super excited when we got it. It's um, a $100,000 grant, um, most of which goes to uh, materials and facilities um, and a little bit for the administration of the grant but we've been able to use it to perform so well Terry's been able to use it to perform some incredible <laughs> plant studies I think he's a little planted out at this point <laughs> maybe <laughs> but still enjoying it hopefully and, uh, a lot of some interesting lot of results yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no complaints so not no complaints at all and you know what you bring it up um and really the premise of, of this uh, meeting between us and whoever's here, the um, without it, right? You look at all the students now that have participated in this endeavor. We must have touched 40, 50 students that have already participated in this research project. Mm -hmm. And so I know it's, you know, as a, as a percentage of students, it's not huge, but you know, that's the key, I think, is getting, getting just to touch it. Just to say, oh wow, you know, I was able to work on this project, and and uh, and, and and to keep them interested in space biology or astrobiology fascinates me to no end. How did life begin? Where did it begin? Algae saved saved the world multiple times. Probably every you know, every event that happened, every earth-ending event that happened that could have. Um, you know, algae brought us back to life, right? And you know, reoxygenated the world. Um, so, I don't know. I'm I'm more than fascinated where we are. So. Yeah, I like that's, that you brought up that, how many students have been able to participate too, because I think in in every single group that we we do here, we we look at that and we say, okay, this is an amazing opportunity, and it's great to have an amazing opportunity with one or two students, but it's it's you know what we wanted. We looked at how many students never get to participate in that, and we wanted to have something that would would enable everyone to maybe be able to get a little touch in it. Um, and uh, and it's it's been exciting to see different projects grow. And, um, you know, so the, so the funding from the, the space grant has been fantastic, enabled us to do things we wouldn't have been able to otherwise. Um, but shout out to the faculty research grants here at APUS as well, which um, initially helped the Supernova Search Group get get um, on the grid, so to speak, and some important um, things that we needed for the telescope to be able to really use it and, um, you know, the grants that are available for for other projects as well. Hey, Kristen, you, you've just returned from North Dakota, where you were setting up and getting things ready for our next mission at the Inflatable Lunar and Martian Analog Astronaut Analog Lab, right? Did, did you get back last night or? Yes. Or, you know, even the wee hours of the morning. So if I, I look a little tired, I probably am. But uh, <laughs> it's okay. Terry's still there. He and I were both there helping set up for it. But yes, oh, okay. our, um, our analog crew who is performing an iteration of the, um, the uh, trial runs for the um, algae project 
uh, just entered the HAB officially yesterday. We had a live stream of it on our YouTube channel, which is amazing. It's still there. So we encourage you all to, to go see it because it turned out really well. Uh, and they are, this is our APUS's first all-female crew in an analog setting. We're very, very proud of them. And they are amazing. And they are, I got word even this morning that they are already starting the plant measurements. So um, we're, we're excited for them and we hope that y'all will follow the mission on, on our social media. There, there is a question in the chat about, um, Terry, you had mentioned the algae project uh, that y'all are working on. And the yeah. question is any conclusions uh, related, initial conclusions related to the algae project work that y'all are doing? Well, I, I'm I'm going to be careful and cautious because uh, I, I don't want to speak out of turn. But Dr. Miller and I have some really promising results. Um, molecularly speaking, I think we have more tests to do. But it looks to me like the um, like the cyanobacteria is bonding with the heavier metals and and maybe even the sulfates that are a part of the Martian regolith, particularly. Uh, we tested Martian in, in my lab back in San Francisco. We, we tested Martian and we tested lunar. Lunar is not, you know, it, it is devoid of life. Martian has a little something to it. It may be the magnesium. It could be some of the um, the nitrates or nitrogen um, in the air or nitrates in the, in, in the surface. But uh, it, it clearly an obvious benefit to the plant. The plant is just like, oh, this is so tasty. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that's not scientific, but uh, so we're working on the scientific side of that. But yes, uh, early results, very impressive. And and Ted Degami is here and Ted did Exolab. Exolab has been up on ISS, I don't know, a dozen times, Ted, or something like that. And they're they're testing all these various type of plants and how the roots perform and the microgravity, which is our next step. That's where we're heading next. Um, so, Dr. Miller, let's hope we we get lucky for that. But anyway, very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Let me let me pose a question to the group at large, um, and this often comes up with online research and university work. Um, so the, the question is, what are some of the challenges that students and professors face conducting, you know, the kind of research that you, you are doing uh, in a virtual environment? What, what are the challenges? If anyone would like to speak to that. I think, uh, I guess I'll just jump in. Uh, one of the, uh, one of the main things that I, I think really comes across this time. So, um, especially being in a virtual environment and, um, having everyone in different time zones and, and, you know, working and, and being part of all these research projects, it's really finding the time to really sit down and discuss the projects, uh, work through any issues that are, that are, coming up with the research and trying to fix things in a timely manner so the project can move forward. So uh, it's in larger groups, time becomes a much larger issue um, to really get everybody to um, be able to meet at a particular time uh, and to be able to discuss things. But there are so many uh, great ways that we can kind of fix that. And you know, now that we have email and, and so many other forms of um, media and connectivity to one another, we're able to then communicate and be able to uh, organize our thoughts and really help, you know, bring that communication together. I mean, one of the things that, um, that we do with the Exoplanet uh, group is we have the Slack channel. So if we're not able to meet, we can at least discuss through the Slack and try to answer questions, whoever uh, is able to answer the question if one comes up or um, if we need to uh, set up a meeting, we're able to easily do that. And there's this open line of communications. So it's a challenge, but we're finding new and innovative ways to kind of work through these things. Yeah, I would absolutely second that. Um, and I think, um, you know, I was thinking as you talked, Michael, also like 
having these um, virtual documents, cloud documents that we can collaborate on, where lots of people can be contributing to and can help edit and throw out suggestions on. I think that's a great tool that we can use in the virtual environment that really aids in those um, in that communication, that line of you know that online participation. I was I was going to say the challenge that I have faced the most in the research groups that I've been a part of in the university is retention and engagement, keeping students engaged, keeping them active in the program. And uh, I think it in the online environment, people um, tend to drop out and ghost. We're part of a ghosting culture a little bit <laughs> that's come about and, and, it, and it can happen. And, um, you know, for a wide variety of reasons and some may, you know, life happens and things come up and that's fine. But, um, you know, so again, that, you know, that regular communication we found in the supernova group that having regular meetings, we do a regular all hands meeting once a month and having that touch base time when everybody comes and we, you know, all chat together, it, it just keeps students active and keeps them coming back. It helps to build that community. And if you can build that community within the group, then people are going to stay because they, they, they like it there. I, I think in general that one of the biggest challenges of online education is the lack of community and the lack of, you know, drawing those peer to peer connections, peer to um, professor connections, you know, all the way around. And so I think, I think we have the opportunity to develop that sense of community um, in these research groups. I think it's also our challenge to be able to really develop a strong community that will um, that people want to stay a part of and keep participating in. Yeah, very, very well said. And I, I can recall back in the early days of online education, uh, going back, showing my age back to the mid to early 90s when, when the internet really started to boom, um, how far, it, it, it's just astonishing how far online education has come with Zoom, um, all of the uh, features that we have, the ability to control a telescope uh, virtually, you know, all the way across the globe is is just incredible in, in the opportunities that our, our students have. And as you've mentioned, some of the the um, challenges that still face us. And of course, with AI, I'm really excited about AI, uh, the possibilities of AI. And it, it's, it, it reminds me a lot of when uh, the, the internet first burst onto the scene. Um, Educators were, were not entirely sure how we can, we knew it was going to be a great thing, but we didn't entirely know how that would work. And um, I think we're, we're sort of at that point with AI and, and um, I think the possibilities are, are just uh, stupendous going, going forward uh, with creative ways to, to uh, educate students and for for self-learning so um let me see jeremy you've you've been teaching online for some time what are what are some challenges that that you have faced in uh not only just teaching online but also conducting research with students online a big challenge is that you are not right in the room with them when they are analyzing data and they can make mistakes as students do because you know they're not professionals and so sometimes stuff will get sent to me that's well unfortunately not the best and it, it's it's quite wrong and, and then you have to basically send it back and say well here's here's what went wrong and and here's how we can correct that uh, in the most professional manner possible. And, you know, it can kind of slow things down. So that's a big challenge. I think it's important to uh, keep up with the latest software in your area because it's always upgrading. We're always changing all the time. Uh, Overleaf.com. Is, is everybody familiar with Overleaf.com? Yes, I see. Caitlin, yes. Okay, good. You guys know that. All right. 
so if you're doing a, a research paper and you're collaborating, uh, that is the way to go, uh, overleaf.com. Jeremy, can you, you say a little bit more uh, about Overleaf um, in terms yeah. of, you know, for folks who are, are new and our students that may not have heard of Overleaf? Overleaf is online software in which you write a LaTeX document. I don't have a lot of time to explain what a LaTeX document is, but basically if you're writing a professional paper, uh, in my opinion, LaTeX is the way to go. It's not Word or other software. I, I would definitely go with LaTeX. And uh, they've really streamlined it. They even have it where you can submit your paper to a professional journal right there from overleaf.com. Yeah, very cool. I have to tell you, I've used it. It's uh, uh, for writing formulas for the orbital mechanics classes. Spectacular. And and then of course they can compound that you know and, and expand on that. So I, I'm a huge fan of Overly. Any other comments or discussion about the challenges of research in the virtual environment? I, I want to second what a lot of been, has been said, but um, building from Dr. Wood's thing, I think what's so challenging is that there is just an overwhelming torrent of stuff. And as advisors and as research advisors, uh, being able to curate through that and find like, oh, this is the best LaTeX software. This is the best citation manager. This is the best, you know, research papers. And that, that can get very overwhelming and very difficult being acting as curator for all of that. And then even just there's, there is a huge overwhelming amount of information. And I find that a lot of it is introductory or very niche professional. And so making sure that we help the students kind of bridge that gap, that they've mastered the introductory material, then there's this whole amount of kind of intermediate as they're learning their way before they can really digest a lot of this professional stuff, whether it be program applications, journal articles, um, and then even things like submitting to conferences and things like that. And, you know, making sure to remember what it's like to be new in the field and that we're bridging that gap um, for students and um, kind of filling those things in and finding the best resources for them can be quite challenging. Absolutely, absolutely. Let me, um, let me see if we have any other questions in the chat and and be sure to, um, uh, if, if you have a question in, in the audience to go ahead and put it in the chat. And let's see, I, I do have a, a question I wanted to pose to the group. How can we continue to, you know, looking forward to the future to improve virtual uh, education and research and robust research as, as we move into the digital age, sort of continuing on, not so much with the problems we're facing now, but looking to the future as the technology develops. So, you know, for example, AI. So how, how, can we um, improve this platform, online research as we go forward? Anyone? That's such an interesting question. I think um, I think in thinking about AI, that the one challenge that comes up with AI is that it is um, it's taking in in some ways it can take away that creative. Um, process from us, that we're relying on AI to create things and um, instead of creating them ourselves. And and I, I'm not saying we need to go back to the dark ages where we had to do everything for ourselves because, you know, I mean, technology in some ways is, is the whole story of technology is the story of how, you know, we have things to do things for us and to do things in a more streamlined and more efficient way so that we can focus on higher um, higher level thinking. And, and so I think that's the same challenge here is that as we, you know, as we have AI and, you know, other, other new and amazing technologies that will follow, 
Um, I think the challenge is to say, okay, those are taking care of the, um, you know, the lower level thinking, the lower level um, objectives. How are we um, staying on top of guiding these technologies, using them appropriately? How are we using them to get to the end point that we want to get to? And how are we keeping the, um, the higher level analysis and um, critical thinking portions squarely in the hands of the humans because that's where it belongs. And so I think, you know, delineating that in our research groups using AI, I mean, it'd be ridiculous not to use a tool that we have, um, you know, progress has never come from ignoring technology, but using, finding an appropriate way to use it in our research and to encourage students to then use that extra time that it gives us and that extra, you know, headspace to, um, to do the higher level thinking and the and the critical analyses part that that are so vital to research process. Absolutely. Yeah, I I want to follow up and just say really making sure that we're fostering that creativity and that curiosity and that um, resilience in our students. And I think the introduction of a lot of shortcuts it makes that so much harder because I think that those tools to you know, come up with a research question, to follow up on the research question, to get overwhelmed by a research question, to find, you know, to hit a roadblock in your data and then still you know, come out of that and, and still persist in the research project. And it, it really takes a lot. And so establish, making sure that we have research projects and advising and um, factors in place to really help the students nurture that, I think, uh, is something just to back to basics and focus on those kind of core principles as we move through these, as we expand and become more global and incorporate new technology. There were uh, a couple of questions in the, in the chat about how students can get involved in the research. And there's, there's one that came in Estrella Blanton is interested in how how can we join the supernova group and um okay working on the associate's degree in space studies and discerning if uh they're interested in continuing on with a bachelor's degree in space studies so how what what is the best way for i i know we advertise in the classroom on a periodic basis to all space studies students and the community at large about um, analog research, exoplanet research, um, supernova research. But what 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 is the the easiest way for a student who is interested in, in getting involved in one of our research groups? Well, I'm so glad you asked, Estrella, and and uh, <laughs> and everyone else thinking about it. We would love to have you get involved. The the um and and you're getting involved for exactly the right reason. The Supernova Group is the right one to to target. That's your first taste of what this research research group is like. And then you know once you become familiar with that, and you if you discover you like it and you want to move on, then we have our more specialized research groups like the Exoplanet Group and and um, you know research with a specific professor that would follow naturally from that. So come to the Supernova group. We'll get you started. Um, I put in the chat, uh, Kenji, I think helped uh, put the messages through. Um, one is a, <clears throat> a website <clears throat> that is our website that details our projects, tells you a little bit more about us and uh, about not only the Supernova group, but other research projects at the university. And the other are two Gmail accounts. Um, both of them, the first one is for the Supernova group. The second one is for ARG. Both of those groups have open um, enrollment at any period. So um, you don't have to wait for a call. You can send an email to either of those groups. The recruitment coordinators will reach out to you. Um, they are always open for um, people who want to join and there are millions of ways to get involved. Um, for the other groups, it's uh, it tends to be on a more specific application only basis, um, but but come get involved and then, you know, all the other opportunities will open up for you. There's, there's a question in the chat about our 
aerospace science concentration. And, and that, as I mentioned earlier, at the beginning of the session that we are uh, looking at evolving that concentration into space engineering, which would immensely help our students and in the current environment of um, being able to join the, the workforce, having some engineering. Now, APUS does already have a, an electrical engineering program. So we're, we're not, it's not our first rodeo in terms of doing engineering at the university. And so, so to answer the question, it, it will be more of a tweaking of the current const, uh, concentration, adding a couple of um, engineering, uh, space type engineering, not so much aero uh, in the atmosphere, but out of the atmosphere, for example, uh, space habitats, space stations, um, uh, space systems, engineering, and modifying other courses. Uh, in fact, our, virtually all of our faculty that teach in the aerospace science, the current aerospace science concentration are themselves aerospace engineers, some of which uh, work for commercial, uh, the commercial space industry. And uh, one professor who has been with us a long time, Keith Woodman for NASA Langley, he's an aerospace engineer at uh, the NASA Langley Research Center. So hopefully that, that will that helps with that question and and look for these changes that will be coming within the next year. Uh, we're hoping to have these in place by the end of 2025. So if, if you're already working your way through aerospace science, don't panic. Uh, the curriculum's not going to be uh, totally flipped over like an apple cart. Um, it will just uh, evolve as we try to do with all of our concentrations to make them more up to date, uh, keeping our courses current and, and relevant. And we think engineering certainly is uh, for those students interested in that sort of thing, uh, having that engineering uh, course background in your pocket will certainly help out in the, the workforce. And correct as Kristen mentioned, mentions we're, we're also working on an undergraduate unmanned aerial vehicle systems uh, or drones concentration. So that, that will be pretty cool. We should have that launched. We're looking at July of 2025 um, for any of you drone pilots out there or wannabe drone pilots. Uh, as a uh, commercial helicopter pilot <laughs> and drone pilot myself, um, this is really the, the, the big thing, I, I believe, in uh, aero, aero atmospheric flying, whether we're on Mars or on one of the moons of Saturn, Titan, uh, having a rotary vehicle and the evolution of uh, rotary flight, I think, is really moving forward with all of the drone or UAS technology that we have. It's much safer too. <laughs> my wife gets, anytime I get in a helicopter, my wife really gets concerned. So it's a complicated vehicle to fly. Drones seem much more stable and use fly by wire and um, just so many applications. Okay, let's see. Just monitoring the the chat, I know we have about six minutes left. Okay, let's see how to go from an applied physics background to astrophysics. Um, I, I shared a, a link to Dr. Katie Mack. She is a theoretical astrophysicist and she has a full 
kind of page of advice for people getting into the field. Some of it is geared towards high school students, some for undergraduates, some for later career. So that might um, be more specific for what does an astrophysicist do? What kind of skills would you need and how you would start kind of preparing for a career in that specific field? I think it's a good um, reference that I share quite a bit. Yeah, excellent, excellent. And our, our um, bachelor's and master's degree program with a concentration in astronomy is a good platform for um, getting into astronomy observational astronomy with the opportunity of utilizing um, our state-of-the-art robotic telescope. And so it, it's a, if you're interested in, in eventually moving onward to a, a PhD, it's, it's a good stackable um, program to, to move. Although we currently don't have a PhD in ast uh astronomy or space studies, uh, many of our students successfully have moved on to other graduate programs elsewhere to uh, pursue a doctoral degree. Yeah, that's why I'm here at the University of North Dakota, the very <laughs> same reason. There you go. <laughs> Case in point, Terry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Ed, if I could just add one last thing here at the end as well. Um, Absolutely. Thinking back to the, you know, the question about how to get involved, I just want to give a little shout out to any of the, anyone listening who is a graduate student, a master's student here at APUS, um, and the importance of thinking about getting involved in research early in your master's degree so that you are prepared when you get to the capstone, right? Because a lot of students want to do a capstone thesis, but um, if you wait till you get to the that point when you've finished all your classes and you're ready to take it, um, you don't have time to do the research. So I want to encourage anyone who's in the master's program, wherever you are in there, to get started now. If you're interested in any of the research we've talked about, you know, reach out to any one of us. We we want to help you find that opportunity to, to get involved in research. Um, if there's some a, a different project that you want to do, master's projects are, are really good to do. Um, in, in some of the um, small group one-on-one -on -one research settings like um, like Jeremy and, and Michael have talked about as well. And um, so, you know, reach out to your professors. If you have a professor who's who's active in an area of research that you're interested in, reach out to them, um, you know, join one of our groups, start learning what's going on. And so you can get, start getting some ideas, but um, my advice is don't wait, get involved and, and make the most of that opportunity. Yes, very, very good point uh, to mention. And let's see, we do have a just, I, I guess, time for one last question. Is uh, the MS in space studies a good foundation for a PhD in space engineering? Well, at, at this point, what you'll want to do is supplement your study with some engineering courses, whether it's from our uh, especially if you're interested in pursuing a doctorate in aerospace engineering or space engineering at this point to make sure you have uh, some foundational or fundamental engineering courses under your belt. And this is exactly what we're currently working on in terms of transitioning our aerospace science into a space engineering concentration. So that, that's the direction that we're heading. But until then, um, if, if you're currently involved in the aerospace science, uh, I would certainly recommend uh, picking up some engineering courses on the side, perhaps as electives in our program. Um, uh, for example, taking some of the fundamental electrical engineering uh, courses just to have that under your belt. Especially, like you say, if you're interested in space engineering at the doctorate level. Okay, we have one minute left. And I am going to put a plug in again for our star party tonight. Virtual star party starting at 9 p.m. And you'll be able to see our 24-inch CDK plane wave in action and hear from actual students who are doing research, faculty and research. Many of us will be there, including myself, 
uh, tonight. But we'd like to, um, yeah, there we are. Uh, we have the link in the chat. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our panel um, panelists here. Thank you for contributing your time and expertise to our discussion today and all of the folks who attended and asking, who had asked, uh, especially those who have asked all these great questions for us. And feel free to reach out to uh, myself or any of our faculty if you have additional questions. So have a great afternoon. Thanks so much and clear skies. And we hope to see you tonight at the virtual star party. Thanks so much.